Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Now, before I begin this week's review, let me first apologize for how late this video is. And while I could make a bunch of excuses for why this video was as late as it was, the main reason is because I was just lazy. And you know, I've already wasted enough time delaying this review, so let's just jump right into it. Now, before I begin this review, you all know the drill. This video will contain spoilers for the newest episode of The Mandalorian, Chapter 16. So if you have not already seen that episode, please do not continue watching this video. And for those of you who have seen the episode, enjoy the review. In my review for The Mandalorian episode titled The Believer, I actually left out like a lot of stuff I wanted to say in that review. Like the music for that episode was like really good and I forgot to mention it in that review. But um, yeah, I'll try not to make the same mistake with uh, th this review because uh, you know, there's not even that much I want to say about this episode, but you know, I'll, I'll try not to leave anything out. So yeah, no, this episode had a really great um and engaging uh, opening scene as all the episodes do and you know yeah I really like this opening scene it was a little less actiony than um most of the Mandalorian episodes um opening scenes but you know it was still a pretty good scene and the scene had of course some beautiful dialogue and I don't know maybe my standards for good dialogue are just like super low since I'm the kind of guy that likes watching Attack of the Clones but you know I I mean I I like pretty much like every piece of dialogue in this series um but you know yeah no this scene had really good dialogue i really liked when the imperial pilot was giving his perspective on the destruction of the death star and alderaan because as i said in my review for the last episode i really love to get to see the imp empire's perspective so you know i'm always happy when i get uh you know get to know a little bit more about what the empire thinks of the universe so you know great opening scene and the, the scene that follows that you know um the scene where like Nando and Boba Fett go to you know kind of pick up Bo-Katan that scene wasn't a bad scene but that scene made me hate Bo-Katan and her group so much which I guess is pretty fitting because this episode kind of sets her up to be the next big baddie of the series but more on that later but you know this this uh this one scene really made me hate Bo-Katan before I even knew that she was gonna be like the big big bad of the next season because dude the way she and her like um sidekick disrespect Boba Fett was it, it, it was unacceptable really and I found it super ironic when Bo-Katan sidekick made fun of Boba Fett for being Mando sidekick because like she's the literal definition of a sidekick she's Bo-Katan sidekick so she has no right to like make fun of Boba Fett for being Mando sidekick and besides Boba Fett's like carrying Mando whenever they're together like he, he's carrying the team when they're together so it's like if anything, they're like partners, but she's bo sidekick. There's no getting around that. So she has literally no right for making fun of Boba Fett for being Mando sidekick. And Boba Fett even calls her out for this. All of that isn't the quite uh, calling this stifling slimy. Whatever that means. bo sidekick should have totally died in this episode because she's a useless side character. And this scene already made her unlikable. So like, there's literally nothing to lose from like killing her in this episode. And if they killed her, that would make the Empire look threatening, which is always a good thing. And, you know, if, if Bogaton sidekick died, that would make her already in a bad mood when she found out that uh, Mando has the right to the Darksaber. So that would make her even more bitter um, when she found out that, you know, Mando kind of did her job for her. And then, you know, that that'd make her even more desperate to accomplish her goal of getting the Darksaber. If her sidekick died, you know, because she'd, she'd be in a dark place, you know, if, you know, her friend died. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think her, I think Bogotan sidekick totally should have died, um, for the reasons I just gave. Also, can we just talk about how useless the stormtroopers are in this episode? Because, like, they literally do nothing except die in this episode. Like, they're, they're honestly kind of pathetic. And I get that they kind of have to be pathetic to make the dark troopers seem all the more intimidating. But, like, still, all they do is get shot. And, just, like, I've never seen, like, I, I don't think any stormtroopers in this episode shoot a gun. Because they die before they get the opportunity to. Like, 
like uh, that's another reason why I think Bogotan's sidekick should have died because it would have made the stormtroopers who are pathetic in this episode seem a bit more intimidating. Or you can have Bogotan's sidekick die from a dark trooper, which would make them more intimidating. I don't care as long as she is dead. But you know, I'm done complaining about this episode because for the majority, there, there's like nothing wrong with this episode. Like I, I, I just wanted to get all the complaining out early in this video because other than the examples I just gave, there's pretty much nothing wrong with this episode. Actually, there is one more thing I want to complain about in this episode and it's a small nitpick don't worry but when um Mando and the crew are trying to dock into the light cruiser the TIE fighters that you know like the TIE fighters that like fly out of the hangar to uh try to blow up Slave 1 those TIE fighters can like barely fit out, out they can barely fly out of the hangar because you know like the hatchway they fly out of is like pretty small so you know the TIE fighters barely fit through but you know when um the when the transport that um Mando and the crew are in, when that goes into the hangar, it has no trouble at all getting in, which is like, I know for a fact those transports are bigger than TIE Fighters, and if the TIE Fighters could like, you know, barely squeeze through the like hangar hatch, you know, uh, to get into, out in space, how, how is, um, the, the transport fitting in there? Because those things are so much bigger than TIE Fighters, but you know what, Th that's the last complaint I have, and you know what, these are all honestly nitpicks more than anything, and, you know, this episode's still, like, really great. Like, I, I really like how in this episode we got to see, like, the dark troopers, um, used to their fullest extent. I really love the scene where Mando is fighting the dark trooper, because, like, for almost the entirety of that fight, the dark trooper is mopping the floor with Mando. <laughs> That's a lot of damage! I'm surprised Mando won that fight at all, and that was just one dark trooper. That scene is definitely in my top three favorite moments from this episode. And other than the standard stormtroopers who only exist to get shot in this episode, the villains are actually pretty intimidating, you know. Like just that one scene alone of Moth Gideon holding the dark saber over Baby Yoda and talking to um, Mando, that scene made Moth Gideon look pretty intimidating even though all he was doing was talking. And you know, the fight scene that ensued after that scene was pretty epic, you know, this series is very good at making fight scenes, and you know, yeah, no, a dialogue, fight scenes, and like cameos are this, uh, this series three uh, best traits. And now we get into the juicy stuff when Bo-Katan finds out that Mando beat Moff Gideon in combat and is therefore the owner of the Darksaber, which, you know, technically sets her up to be the villain of the um, next, like, series, because after, after she, like, um, you know, explains to Mando that she can't take the Darksaber from him unless she beats him in combat. After she explains that to him, she doesn't really talk much, but, you know, we know that, like, she's not gonna be friends with Mando in the next season. Let's just put it that way. Um, so yeah, they're definitely not gonna be, um, you know, teaming up like they were in this season, in the next season. Season three is shaping up to be pretty unpredictable because, like, we know that bo is gonna be, like, the villain of it in some capacity, but, like, we don't really know how because she's kind of friends with Mando by now. But, like, you know, she's definitely gonna need to take back that Darksaber. So maybe, like... Maybe she'll be like the villain in the first couple of episodes, and then maybe she'll fight Mando. And then after that point, they'll be friends again. I, that seems unlikely. Um, so yeah, I don't know what's going to happen because I don't really think they're going to be all-out enemies in the next season. You know, Mando and Bo-Katan. I don't think they're going to be like, you know, like enemies, like full-on enemies. But they're definitely not going to be like friends. Maybe... Mm, I, I, yeah, I really don't know what, what'll happen, um, in the next season in regards to, uh, possessions of the Darksaber. Anyways, after that all happens, Dark Troopers start to hunt down Mando, and you will never guess who saves them. I mean, you probably can guess, because I'm hoping all of you have seen the episode by now, and for those of you who have not seen the episode and have watched the video all the way up to this point, you have to click off the video right now, because the person that saves Mando is Luke Skywalker, and I would have never guessed that Luke is the person to save Mando, 
I would have been willing to bet real money that the Jedi who would save Mando and Grogu would be Ezra, just because that seems so much more in the cards for this series to introduce Ezra. But the second I saw that iconic lightsaber hilt and glove, I knew that it was Luke Skywalker who we were dealing with here. And, you know, I had no idea that this show had the guts to bring in Luke Skywalker. I said this in my last video, or maybe the video before that, but I had, I would not, I did not think that Luke Skywalker was going to be the one to come in this episode, just because he's such an iconic character, and I had no idea that this show would be willing to mess with such an iconic character, or not mess, improve such an iconic character, and you know, I, I, I'm glad the show did. I'm glad the show brought him back, because over the last 10 years, the only times we've seen Luke in live action was in The Rise of Skywalker and The Last Jedi, and while Luke in The Rise of Skywalker wasn't that bad, we all know that Last Jedi, Luke Skywalker, was an absolute mess, so I'm glad that this series had the guts to bring it back and, you know, make him the hero we all remember him as, and, you know, kind of fix um The Last Jedi and everything it did to ruin his character. So, you know, I'm glad they brought him back. It was such an epic moment. You know, like, dude, seeing him tear through the Dark Troopers, which we previously saw, like, almost kill Mando, was so epic. Like, he, he tear through them like butter, when, like, Mando could barely kill one. Like, it's so cool to just to see how powerful Luke Skywalker is. Um, it's, I, I don't know, I, I think I've said everything, but, you know, Luke Skywalker in this series is so cool and I, I no one's denying that and I guess some people are a bit like put out I guess you could say by the CGI on Luke's face and all I can say about that is well the de-aging effects on Luke in this series weren't perfect they were certainly better than the effects we got on him in uh you know the flashback in the rise of Skywalker so you know definitely an improvement there at least he doesn't look like a mid 2000s video game character anymore then we get a cameo from R2D2 and Ragu decides to go with Luke to get his training which really makes me wonder like it was Ragu with like at Luke's temple when Kylo Ren killed all the like you know all of Luke's students I hope he wasn't if Grogu is like that that would be so disappointing so I'm pretty sure that Grogu's gonna come back in the series even though he left with Luke to get training he's gonna have to come back at some point so he's away from uh you know Luke's Jedi temple when Kylo Ren turns bad and you know burns the whole thing down but you know with that Luke and R2-D2 have Grogu and the episode ends or does it? Because there was an end credit scene for this episode, and for those of you who have not seen the end credit scene, and I don't think most of you have seen the end credit scene, so, uh, yeah, no, there is an end credit scene for this episode, um, so, if you haven't seen it, do not continue watching this video, because it's a pretty awesome end credit scene, and, yeah, so, but for those of you who know there was an end credit scene and have seen it, let me just give my quick, uh, thoughts on it. It was, it was a pretty good one. I really like how the scene gave us an idea of what Boba Fett will be doing after the events of season two. And you know, a new Boba Fett series will be coming out. And Boba Fett, even though he's an iconic character, has never had his own TV show. So I'm super excited to see what this series will bring. I'm assuming it's going to be about like Boba Fett leading like, I guess, Jabba the Hutt's clan, but except Jabba's dead. So he'll be leading it now. And that's pretty epic. The only real question I have is like, where is Jabba? a son in all of this because Jabba has a son so you think he'd be the like the heir to the throne I guess of Jabba um not Bib Fortuna who was the man in charge when uh Boba Fett stepped in um but you know I mean I, I don't really care I don't think anyone other than me noticed that um you know I, I'm a big Clone Wars fanboy so of course I notice when um Jabba's son is missing even though he technically should be the heir to the throne uh, I'm, I'm probably the only person that noticed that, though, so, you know, it's it's, it's cool to see Bib Fortuna, you know, in Jabba's throne, and extremely fat, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I know Boba Fett came in, and he killed everyone, and now he's the leader of Jabba the Hutt's Tatooine clan thing, yeah, um, so, yeah, and that was, that, that end credit scene was probably my favorite end credit scene of all time, yes, better than the MCU end credit scenes better than any other random end credit scene from any movie that you know of. Um, th that that is my f new favorite end credit scene. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's cool. Uh, really great end credit scene. Really great episode overall. Um, if I, I like my favorite moment from this episode would probably be um, 
you know, Luke Skywalker coming in and do, like, I think that's everyone's favorite moment, right? Luke Skywalker coming in and, um, you know, being Luke Skywalker, basically. Um, oh, and I uh, forgot to talk about the music in this episode. Um, music in this episode was really unique. Um, uh, most episodes of The Mandalorian just like to play the Mandalorian theme over and over again. Uh, and this episode kind of did that with its music, but it also, like, showed a different, a bigger variety of music in the episode. Like, it didn't just play the Mandalorian theme over and over. It, like, had, you know, had different types of music. It played the Dark Trooper theme, uh, Moff Gideon theme, you know. It, it was a really good episode music-wise and everything else-wise, and yeah, I mean, I think my only major complaint about this episode is I really wish uh, Bo-Katan's sidekick died, but you know, other than that, re really, really great episode, and you know, uh, so, you know, let's go over to the tier list, and obviously, I think you all already know where I'm going to put it, but it is SM tier. Now, as I mentioned a couple videos ago, the episodes in Siege of Mandalore tier aren't really on the same level as the Siege of Mandalore, because I think reaching that level that Siege of Mandalore was at is pretty much impossible, but I think these episodes in Siege of Mandalore tier are on the level of Siege of Mandalore by the Mandalorian series standards, um, because the Clone Wars series has higher standards for what a good episode is than the Mandalorian is, so, but, you know, for the Mandalorian standards as a good episode, then these episodes are in Siege of Mandalore here, so that was way over complicating it, but, you know, the, these, uh, these two episodes uh, on the top here, definitely worthy of being Siege of Mandalore here by this series standards, and, you know, it, yeah, no, this is, a uh, I think, yeah, no, Siege of Mandalore here, and I, I'm pretty solid with the way this tier list turned out. Um, you know, I was kind of worried that all the episodes would be too cramped in I tier. And, you know, I tier is pretty full. But, you know, I, I was able to kind of, like, spread it out more. You know, have some episodes in A tier, some episodes, one episode in M tier. Um, and, you know, two episodes in SM tier. So, you know, it's pretty spread out across the board in this list. Um, I might get rid of D tier at some point if I if I do this tier list thing um, for the next season. I might get rid of D tier because that's pretty much useless. But um, yeah, no. So yeah, I think that basically wraps up everything I wanted to say in this episode. And yeah, no. I uh, so since uh, season two of The Mandalorian has ended, you can expect a lot like a lot more diverse content from this channel now because you know for like. A couple months now, I've just been reviewing The Mandalorian, but now you can expect some more diverse content from this channel, which is a good thing, I think. And, you know, if you're interested in seeing that, subscribe. And uh, if you like the video, leave a like. And yeah, no, that's pretty much everything I wanted to say in this video. And I'll, I hopefully will see you in the next video. See you later.